Hello, everyone. Welcome to the North American edition of Ask Me Anything. We're here today to, for your chance to ask anything about Tridian. And we have gathered a panel of our experts to answer whatever questions you might have about the architecture and the vision of the Tridian product family. Maybe you've had a question come to mind during one of the preceding sessions but didn't have the time or opportunity to ask. Well, now you have the chance. So I'm sure you're eager to get going and to keep things organized and efficient, we're gonna ask you to please type your questions into the Q&A feed. And I think everybody should be familiar where that is by now. In this way, we can see all the questions as they come in and manage them if needed. And really this is your cue to start typing your questions. And while we give everyone a chance to do that, I'm just gonna do a little quick introduction of everyone. Um, and actually I should first introduce myself uh, might be an unknown face to many of you. My name is Julie Landman, and I am senior technical writer with RWS, formerly SDL. I was I joined SDL four years ago after having first been an SDL customer, actually, and a direct end user of the Tridian Dots product. And my purpose here today is actually to do what I do a great deal of in my job, which is to ask questions, lots and lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, on to our panelists. First off, we have Lee Khan Sulike, and sorry, Lee Khan, I always butcher your name. He is the architect for Tridian Sites. Lee Khan is based in Amsterdam and has worked in software development for almost 20 years, and more than half of those years have been with Tridian Sites. And when he's not tinkering with Tridian architecture, Lincoln, Lee Khan likes tinkering with other things, namely home automation and automobiles. Next up, we have representing Tridian Docs, we have Dave DeMeyer, and you just saw his presentation, so you know a bit about him already. And he is senior architect also, and development manager and release train engineer, and before joining R&D, had a number of roles in customer support for Tridian Docs. Um, Dave lives and works in Belgium, and true to his roots, he enjoys the occasional Belgian beer. <laughs> And last but not least, we have a Tridian product owner for content delivery, which is Dragon Nanik. Dragon is a relatively recent addition to the Tridian team, but he has a broad experience with technology software development, implementation, and delivery. He's originally from Serbia, now living in Amsterdam, and can point out various differences between North and South of Europe. Now, one quick thing before we start with the questions, we'd like to draw your attention to the Tridian Sites Certification Program, which is targeted at Tridian Sites Consultant Community. If you would like information on this program, you can find download of the syllabus on the intro to this session. And with that, let's get started. And I need to put my glasses on for this because I've got to look at the questions and they're really small. So, <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. So we, the first question we have is for Dave. So everybody, Dave, what is the future of content importer? So content importer is, um, is one of our desktop clients that takes care of, uh, legacy imports or translation imports. And, um, yeah, we actually only a good year ago, I think we, we revamped it a lot and it went to the next level. Um, and we will keep that because it's an important tool to onboard customers and even for the running processes, working with the engineering departments, um, they need the tool to get some artifacts in that come from somebody else where somebody else owns the master, like uh, pictograms or, or certain screenshots from other applications. So that's a, a tool which is important and yeah, needs to be able to handle a lot of data. Yeah. Okay, great. The next question we have for Dragon and Lee Khan. On the content manager side, you're introducing the Core Service REST API and is following the open API spec. Why on content delivery side are you using GraphQL? Well, I can speak for the CD side uh, of the things. We want to provide the uh, free form query language uh, that would um, suit with the content delivery and uh, to allow our users to actually build the uh, content consuming applications in a nice uh, and efficient way. Uh, and GraphQL allows you to do exactly that uh, because it supports uh, multiple queries, once, uh, that you can fetch the data that you need uh, 
uh, and only that, and you don't need to worry about uh, the rest. And uh, it is quite uh, up to date with the current standards, and a lot of developers like it. Yeah, that is for CD side. Um, yeah, and for uh, for the CM side, right? So uh, we are starting with the uh, with the Open API spec based uh, REST API because it is a lot simpler, right? And it's uh, and if you look at the use cases on Content Manager side. This we feel, and and based on our based on feedback, we feel that this is uh, this is a good place to start with. That doesn't mean that we will never have GraphQL on the CM side. We might, but the first one is something that we are looking into. Uh, uh, we are looking into the core service rest, and also to add to Dragon. I think the GraphQL also follows nicely with our semantic content modeling because that actually allows us to retrieve uh, domain specific uh, uh, items with with what properties you want. So that that basically with our uh, uh, headless ex uh, experience, we feel that the GraphQL is something which is very crucial for the delivery side. But yeah, and the, on the content manager side, we are not saying that we will never have it. Okay. Next question. Um, Dave Leacon, this is a two-parter. So what is the ultimate goal for .NET Core? And our second part, will we be able to run the product on Linux? Well, as an ultimate goal, I think it's uh, it's a good point on the horizon where we were mm -hmm. heading to. Um, but we have some route in between to take. So uh, we're still working to get all everything on .NET Framework, um, then to .NET Standard, and then we're entering .NET Core territory. But even that by itself has some milestones in, in between because in the beginning, you still run on Windows because, as just mentioned, uh, import routines are very um, Windows aware and not necessarily easily mixed to a Linux world. Um, so we'll move there. But yeah, uh, it, the, the .NET Core definitely enables us to go to Linux and containerization and beyond. They can. Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, indeed, the same goes for the sites components as well. In, our, in the presentation, I think both Dave and I, we presented like, okay, what is the path and what are we actually planning on doing, right? And you have also seen like, okay, what are the what are the blockers on that path and what are the potential impact once we actually reach that, that we are considering. So indeed, at the end, yes, we want to be a multi-platform containerized uh, with a very, uh, let's say, lightweight uh, microservices. Uh, but yeah, .NET Core is just uh, a stepping stone. But also what we are doing currently is that all the, the new services that we are writing based on, which are essentially C-sharp .NET based application, they are all uh, .NET Core multi-platform services. And you can already see that in the examples of add-on service and access management. That's it, okay. And this is again today and Rather different question. Will you be supporting Oxygen 23 in trading index? Uh -huh. Platform support. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Oxygen 23 is on the list. Um, it's something we have to do to, to catch up and keep up like so many other platforms. So um, there already have been uh, planning discussions where Oxygen 23 is mentioned. I think it has a good chance to be part of our release later this year. Um, so, yeah. Okay. It's coming. All right. And back to Leacon. <laughs> Our implementation is still using Dreamweaver templates. If I upgrade to the latest version, will it still work? So yes, the Dreamweaver templates uh, still work. But uh, what we see, I think, if you also uh, see how the, the semantic content modeling uh, is going forward, right? So we are, we are slowly moving away from these what we called baked HTML publishing, right? So where we were generating HTML, where we are moving more towards uh, a content, uh, headless experience publishing, where we are only responsible for the content. Um, it is still there, it is still working. Uh, but what I can tell is that we will be deprecating explicitly Dreamweaver templates sometime soon. But yeah, it is not gonna stop working for a while. And if you have experience with 3D Insights, you know, like our support is, uh, you know, we, we, we tend to support things for a pretty long period of time. But is it the future? No, we should, we should start looking into how can we move beyond Dreamweaver templates. All right. Okay, next question, we're back to you, Dragon. 
Do you have recommendations on how to build a single page application with React using the GraphQL API? Well, recommendations, we uh, actually uh, advise everyone to follow the best practices around uh, securing the endpoint, uh, making sure that uh, uh, there is uh, prevention from like denial of service from multiple uh, requests there, because then the GraphQL uh, API endpoint is basically there in the open. And uh, also there is another aspect of uh, making sure that uh, all the queries that you send to GraphQL uh, are actually executed within the proper uh, uh, and expected response time so that you don't uh, send some uh, long running query that uh, would block uh, everything. And in fact, we are uh, working on a solution to enable uh, all this uh, for our cloud customers uh, by introducing uh, API gateway uh, uh, also within our solution. And that is something that should be available somewhere around Q4 this year. All right. And looking for the next question. Okay, uh, we're staying with you, Dragon. How extensible is the public content GraphQL API? And can it be connected to other databases or APIs? Well, uh, yes, uh, depends on the, the, the type of uh, extension that uh, you would like to do. Uh, like uh, the connection to databases is actually done um, in our uh, backend and we support a uh, couple of uh, uh, databases there. So for other people wanting to connect to something else, uh, we would like to look into that and uh, make sure that uh, uh, for some specific databases that are not on our list uh, of support, we make sure that uh, our uh, professional services verify the solution and that, that they uh, uh, manage to have everything uh, in line with uh, all our services set up correctly, etc. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, another thing is that then it would require a specific uh, thing about maintenance, maintenance, uh, something like that, because it would be highly customized. <laughs> Just just to add to that, right? So if you look into the GraphQL and if you look into the connected framework, the way if you actually want to extend, because you probably are not actually talking to a database per se, right? What you want is you want external data to be available through GraphQL because you want that probably to be your single point of entry for your uh, either uh, mobile apps or your web application. In that way, the connectors is the way forward where you can build a connector and then, yeah, you can essentially use your connector to hook into any data store. and be the database, which, okay, it's probably, it could be, could be, right? You might have your custom data source and you actually want to expose it using connectors. That could very well be a use case, but then also using other APIs. But the way to do it is indeed the, the connectors. Uh, but for us, yeah, additional databases is not something that, uh, yeah, it's not something that we are looking at uh, or, or yeah, thinking about because right now we already have multiple databases and our platform support matrix is pretty complex enough already. Okay. All right. Um, Nikon, stay with you. Um, get to talk some more. <laughs> when will you add support for workflow to the new user interface and for the insights? Oh, that's an interesting question. I would love to do that as soon as possible because I would love to get rid of Visio as soon as possible. But uh, what we are currently doing is our focus is on the editorial experiences, right? So once we are complete, once we complete the editorial experiences, I think workflow, uh, basically being able to create workflow, if we look at, um, again, it's based on our, based on feedbacks and based on experience, it's not really that high on, on the backlog. We will do it, but if you look at workflow creation by itself, it's not something that you do on a daily basis, right? It's most likely you do it on once you actually, when you are in the deployments or every now and then you are customizing. So that's not a very common use case. We will do it, but it's not, first we want to look at, uh, so the, the way we are looking at it, it's, it's from a priority perspective, like what are the most used use cases, right? And then once we are done, we will at one point reach that and then we will build it but mm -hmm. it's not planned in the next release, let's say. Okay. This is for Dave and or Likon, both of you. What about support for the SAML 2 protocol in Tridian Docs? Um, for Tridian Docs, I think it's a 
protocol that we will well that we will likely skip in favor of OpenID Connect, as I mentioned in the presentation. Um, we will internally standardize of OpenID Connect because it's the the new thing and and it's the the current favorite uh, among, among many parties. Then again, with the with access management as a kind of a hub, a gateway for federation, it can still mean that the gateway will allow SAML to your um, SDS, to do your identity provider, and allows you to have an extra hop in SAML before we align to our common to our common protocol. So. And uh, to add to that, right, so um, as, as they mentioned, indeed, so access management already supports XAML, and wherever we are actually federating, we, we, we all the applications who are using access management as the federation uh, gateway, they can, they already support all of the protocols that access management supports, XAML, OpenID Connect, uh, Windows, and LDAP. And at the same time, uh, what we have done, uh, and that's in scope of 9.6, so in 9.5, we only have the 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 old ui so essentially the cme xpm the new experience space add-on service and access management only using access management uh, authentication model but in 96 uh, we have moved all so if you look at the stack all of the stack is now moved into through access management so all the protocols so you can also use xaml now if you're using template builder or visual workflow designer uh, or a content border, so it doesn't really matter which uh, which application you are using on the Trillion sites. You will be allowed to use SAML or any of the supported authentication from Access Management. Okay. All right. Um, Dave, will Ish Remote be adapted to the Open API of Trillion Docs, and will it be compatible? Um, that's a good question to to look into the future. So. Um, uh, the, the essence of issue remote is that it's a um, it's a, an API in in the PowerShell world in the PowerShell language um, that is very close to the public API we have. Uh, so the the WCF SOAP API or the 2.5 API that that has a very tight relationship. Um, there is a possibility to keep the PowerShell API stable so that the commandlets and everything you have keeps working um, and that we rewire it to open API. Um, happy to accept contributions because it is in, uh, in, in <laughs> GitHub as an open source thing, but also engineering uses the tool um, uh, as well during setup phases. So we deliver it as, a, as part of, of the installation media. Mm -hmm. And we also use it as a tool to do uh, uh, regression testing and more so that we can confirm that the API is stable. So we will spend that effort on it. As a, Another viewpoint on it is that um, not too long ago, I, I shared a blog post and a, and a, a page on the GitHub as well um, with the idea of going to an issue mode version seven where the seven hints to PowerShell seven. So something that runs in PowerShell uh, seven and, and beyond as well. Um, for that, we will have to do something about authentication um, as, as shared in the presentation. So I think we can keep it fully compatible, except the authentication bit. There we'll probably have to do something smart, just like we have to do for the other tools we have on top of the API. OK, let's see. Um, Likan, in headless publishing, if you remove templates from the page, how can editors manipulate, choose to render a particular article, like wide, white, dark, et cetera, without pushing that information into the content itself. Yeah, so I think if you um, if you were actually, so in, in the presentation, in the talk, uh, I was actually talking about the contextual metadata, right? So right now we are looking into adding some contextual metadata that you can provide. So, so what we are doing explicitly uh, is we are ensuring that the templates are not able to actually uh, modify the data, right? Because our very crucial thing is to ensure that the data is immutable, right? And it's also idempotent. So anytime, if you do not change the data, it doesn't matter if you publish it n times, it should result in the same output. 
Uh, so, so in order to achieve the idempotency potency and the immutability of the data, we need to ensure that the templates by itself cannot really make any changes to the data or it cannot really add or remove things. So uh, what is uh, what we are now looking into is like, okay, how can we still add some contextual metadata without really a lot with, with actually blocking people from modifying the content? So that's something that we are now working on. Uh, but yeah, for uh, in scope of uh, nine five, what you can already do if you look into uh, what we have done, uh, we, we we out of the box we provide a, a data template for a page where which you can see it's an empty template. So you can actually simulate an empty template which actually does not modify data or generate any HTML output, but uh, you can use that template to add some additional contextual metadata which you can use. Uh, it is still gonna have your pure data output but the only difference is that uh, the the uh, the, cont the template is not going to be modifying any data and currently we are looking into alternatives on how we can support it better out of the product okay all right hmm. questions are slowing down a bit but we still have a few i think mm -hmm. waiting <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, okay, Dave, what is happening to browser-based clients in Fridian Dots? Uh, browser-based clients, yeah, I think the, the browser is, is the future. Uh, I think a lot of us are, are getting used to working with applications inside browsers. Mm -hmm. um, also from a, a service perspective, it's a lot easier, it's a lot more cloud-friendly. When systems upgrade, then uh, then the browser application, the web application, just follows along. It's it's a very nice uh, path, um, and I think probably the question hints to towards what what happens with the desktop clients, which mm -hmm. is of course a very rich experience. Um, can do a lot more heavy lifting. Has knowledge about inside concepts like uh, baselines and gives you a lot more insights in how how data works or even look up mm -hmm. logical identifiers through it. So it's, um, I think those those rich client tools are there to stay. They will serve a certain audience, but we'll have to find a way to, to making a bit more cloud friendly or give an out alternative in the web applications for them over time. But that is a, that is a couple of steps into the future. Okay. All right, let's see, next question. I don't see another question, let's give it a second. Looks like we've come to the end of our questions, unless one comes up very soon. Um, I am gonna just remind everybody again about the Trudy Insights certification program. Again, it's um, targeted, you guys, the Trudy Insights consultant community, and the link is on the syllabus to this program. And I think that is it. So thanks, Dave, Dragon, Likon, for all of your excellent answers. <laughs> and thanks you all for attending, everybody that's out there. And until next time.